Thank you for such a, a frank and honest elucidation of you know, the challenges and the compromises MSF faces in the operations in Syria. I'm sure they'll be echoed by many in the rooms, but still, you know, it, it's really appreciated that you've taken us through them you know, with such openness. And it's not easy, I know. I must say that you know, the, the, the level of attacks on the medical mission in Syria leave me stunned completely. And, and you know, you've clearly elucidated the extent to which this is happening. And, and thanks also for putting the failure in perspective, you know, where it really lies <coughs> on, on the side of whom. But let me open this to questions from the audience here in house first, and I'll take questions uh, from the online audience too. Um, just keep your hands up, and uh, there'll be microphones going around. Left them completely silent. Maybe I was a bit too gloomy. I need to cheer people well, up. Well, I now. think people. Gloomy. Francesc. I'm not. Um, I haven't been involved in the humanitarian issues more in the political ones, but may I, at the risk of sounding like a uh, devil's advocate, to what degree is the approach taken by the government in Damascus link to the approach, <coughs> the political approach of the French government in being as strongly, possibly, at the vanguard of anti, um, the, uh, in the vanguard of opposing. Uh, the government in Damascus, and to what degree are you perceived as a French organization, uh, which um, and, and, and vice versa? To what degree is the opposition willing to open the doors to you, because uh, basically you come from friendly countries? And are there other humanitarian organizations who have managed to deliver assistance, or are you a classic example? of many other humanitarian organizations unable to deliver assistance uh, with the cooperation of the government in Syria? I mean, this is a good question. Maybe, so let me take two or three. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. There are yeah. others, otherwise just uh, respond to Francesc. Is there any other immediately? No. Oh, Dennis at the back. Uh, Jerome, thanks. Um, MSF has been a um, rather privileged uh, critic, a respective critic of the humanitarian system for a long time from a slightly outside point of view. And we've talked here today about some of the failures that you've touched on. But what is, uh, tell us, what is the MSF doing as an organization to try and improve the international system as such, the humanitarian international system, which is failing in many respects? Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to know, as you sit in that slightly distant situation, what, uh, what you think might be done. And secondly, do you have any comments on the failure of the Security Council today, apparently, <coughs> to authorize a peacekeeping mission to CAR, which uh, U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power has just justified uh, to Al Jazeera? So I wonder if you have any thoughts yeah. on, on, on that as well. Okay. I start with those. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can always expect our advisory group and our colleagues to okay. be kind. <laughs> Um, thank you, it's Suzanne Jaspers from uh, Bristol <laughs> University. Um, I, I haven't. I have to admit, I haven't followed the Syrian crisis slowly. I've been mainly focused on Sudan for the last um, few years, and I can see lots of parallels. Even though Syria is, of course, much more extreme, I can just see lots of parallels um, uh, in Sudan. I mean, almost everything you said could could apply to Sudan as well, and. Um, in particular, uh, currently, the denial of um, government access um, to um, conflict-affected conflict populations in South Kordofan uh, for the international community. And I guess, I mean, there's two issues that I'd like you to, to comment on there. I mean, one is that kind of echoing Keynes research, I mean, what's a, a failure for international agencies is a policy, a policy success for the Sudan government. I mean, in the, since the last kind of the, the major Bargazal famine in 1988, the government has built up a whole kind of network of local NGOs, strategic reserves. So it's, 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 it's using its own kind of aid infrastructure, but of course, you know, very much along its own priorities. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm thinking about, 
And I guess the other thing is in, in Sudan, it's, it's very clear, or the government is very clear, why it doesn't want international NGOs in, in places like South Kordofan, you know, following experience or its perception of what they were doing in South Sudan and, and Darfur. So I guess my question is, is kind of, um, What um, I mean is the Syrian government uh, providing any kind of uh, relief to populations in government-held areas? I mean, what is it? I mean, is it doing anything like that? Mm -hmm. And what's its objection to MSF working on both sides? I'll just take Jane, and then we'll come back to yeah. you. Since. Jane Cocking from Oxfam. Uh, Jerome, thank you very much indeed for setting out so clearly and lucidly the challenges of working in Syria. Um, we share your frustration and a lot of the analysis that you set out in front of us. Um, our position is, if you like, the mirror image of, of MSF, and that's why I think it's worth mentioning. Um, we are working from Damascus, and after months of glacial progress, we are finally delivering water to a quarter of a million people on, we believe, both sides of the conflict, um, while at the same time attempting to balance that action uh, with, our, with our, our, our commitment to speaking out and campaigning on the causes of the conflict. So we have a different action. We share much of your view. I suppose my questions based on that are possibly the impossible one, which again taxes us on a daily basis, which is what is the alternative? And my second question is, do you think there are opportunities that if we were to work together more closely, we could achieve something more together? And if so, who should be our target for that? Should it be, as Dennis has mentioned, the Security Council, or are there other more creative solutions that we are all missing at this point? Thank you. Go on. Okay, so a lot of questions, and I think some related. Um, you know, the the question about uh, what is the Syrian government doing? The uh, Jane's point about you know what they're able to do in um, in uh, in Syria today, but also the, the the kind of French link that was mentioned. I mean, just to be clear, I do think today in Syria what you have is. Uh, uh, different levels of blockages that occur. Yes, relief efforts are happening and they're even going cross line. It's not like a total blockage to go across cross line. But this is very well chosen by the government what's happening. Uh, you're not getting any medical life saving activities across the front lines. It's really water, vaccination today, vaccination why prevention certainly, uh, and preventing this from spreading beyond these areas. Uh, but you have a very cynical use of how the aid is able to go across borders and what aid is chosen to go across borders. And suddenly as a medical organization, we're finding today that all, there is no one going across border to reach the enclaves or to reach the areas that we're working in, or I mean across line, not across border, but across line, that is providing medical care of any significant way. And suddenly not life-saving uh, medical care. So in a conflict where you have civilians stuck in the middle of, uh, um, of war, the provision of being able to allow the civilians to access, to be able to allow the, the, the evacuation of the wounded, because let's not forget, once wounded, you are no longer a combatant either, is actually shocking in terms of how it's not able to have happened today in Syria. And so you, you do have a gradation, certainly, of uh, openness which is starting to come after slow and very slow progress. But we're two years into the conflict. Who is witnessing what's going on in the enclaves? Who is actually doing more than being able to do some dropping into these areas and knows what's happening? I mean, if this had happened in Yugoslavia, uh, we would have been shocked. There would have been you know, a parallel which would not have been acceptable. But today, there is no one living the reality of these populations in those enclaves. And we are now with the media, uh, the, the kind of hyper uh, politicization, also a bit suspicious in terms of what's coming through in the social medias and all this. is a natural kind of suspicion and very little verification in terms of what's happening. So to answer the questions about, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of aid, we are not on the Khartoum side, on the, sorry, what a slip of the tongue. We are not <laughs> on the Damascus side. We are, um, uh, we are on the opposition side, clearly. 
And what we can do is judge the blockages and judge what is not coming across towards where we are working. And for the moment, medical aid is not going across these borders. Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's extremely important to be able to have water, it's extremely important to be able to have relief items. But again, the hard, life-saving, it, kind of, it, it, it kind of diminishes the, the daily reality of violence that these populations are facing, when actually what the international community can provide is only relief items. These people are suffering on a daily basis, children, mothers, uh, uh, an assault on their lives through real violent means. And this is not something that is actually coming through. And this is where I think the compromises that you know, Oxfam or other actors that are there, then the limitations of your actions have to be very clear. Because otherwise there's a kind of a vision, well, we are able to be operational across Somalia, we are able, uh, able to be operational across Syria, uh, we are able to actually deliver um, but what are we delivering and what are the compromises, the constraints? We need to be able to see these and really make policy makers and deci decision makers face that reality, which is not something that's really happening in a strong enough manner today. Now, in terms of the French connection, well, of course, in the, you know, this is not, I wouldn't pit Syria against France in this one. It's a much more complex environment. I mean, just about every government and every interest in the region uh, is there and is actually trying to feed in their interests through co-opting, in a way or another, some of the actors on the ground. Uh, so while it probably doesn't help to be maybe labelled as uh, a French organisation, and, you know, we've also tried to, to uh, reach... Uh, uh, Damascus uh, through some of our other networks of, uh, of MSF, through the South African network and, uh, and so on. This hasn't really helped. Now obviously maybe the French identity is very strongly there, but at the end of the day what's important, even if we are not able to uh, work through Damascus, is that medical operators are able to work through Damascus and we see none that are able to really work <coughs> through Damascus in a broad way to access the most needy areas. Now, uh, the question in terms of uh, the Syrian government's uh, capacity to use some of the local actors in the parallel to potentially what, uh, uh, what is happening in North Sudan to reach, uh, uh, be it um, Kordofan or the Blue Nile states and so on. Um, you know, I, I obviously we, there is a big capacity again that's been developed and most of the aid is actually working through the Syrian Red Cre Arab Crescent. So. And um, uh, so the SARC is actually channeling, channeling most of the aid. But again, uh, while they do some, uh, some, some small advanced medical posts, there is no big surgical capacity that's been developed out of this capacity. I didn't mean it was effective. <laughs> no, but again, you know, that, and, and in, in fact, it's actually probably a way in which that aid can be very much controlled as well to, to a large extent. Um, and, uh, and of course it's compromises that have to be made to be able to at least deliver something but the question is that balance between what is being delivered compared to what is really needed on the ground. Um, now that's, uh, I think I've covered most of the questions yep, on, and um, I've got plenty more. on on, uh, <laughs> on Syria but the, the car <laughs> question is an important one because obviously uh, you know deployment of, uh, of peacekeepers uh, or not, uh, I mean, the problem is just so deep in car in terms of a completely destroyed infrastructure. One of our colleagues recently came back from car and he said, you know, uh, walking out of the airport, it looked like Haiti in terms of devastation. It looked like, a, you know, th this kind <coughs> of natural disaster had occurred on a place which hadn't seen a natural disaster, where just the infrastructure is totally collapsed. Um, so, you know, this is something that's ignored until you get a peak of violence that we're getting today. And of course we're very happy and there's a necessity for a mobilization, whichever kind of mobilization there is, a maximum mobilization, instead of fun in terms of funding, in terms of political <coughs> engagement, in terms of finding a solution. Uh, but you know, this, this is something that should be happening when the country is not within that peak. Uh, this is, you know, out of that peak, they've been, on the, 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 the civilian populations there have been facing a chronic conflict have been facing a huge gap in provision of everything. I mean, we see the health side, but it's across the board in terms of uh, all the infrastructure. There is not much left in car, and it's off the radar, and it's off the political interest until <coughs> we get to this peak. Now, if you want to act in this peak and act responsibly, it's got to be a massive level of action that is required. <coughs> not only massive because we need to deal with the humanitarian problems of the peak, but massive because if you don't deal with the other problems behind, well, you know, we'll be back to what car was before that peak of violence and again there in the next wave of the violence. So, you know, there is a need to really uh, step up and uh, 
Um, and while it, it's great that you know, there's been commitment by some, there's been discussion by some, maybe for or against one way or the other, I mean, it's, it's all too late and it's got to be a lot more today than what we're seeing. Let me get a couple of questions from the online audience. There's a question from uh, Jeremy Labbé in uh, New York, the International Peace Institute. So Jeremy is asking, given the increased fragmentation and radicalization of armed groups in besieged areas in Syria, is cross-border access as crucial as it was a few months ago? And the other question is from Elias at the Global Pol Public Policy Institute in Berlin who asks, you mentioned the MSF has innovative methods for monitoring its indirect operations to manage them or even train. Can you give some examples and what are the key remaining <laughs> challenges? And I've got Oistin and uh, Jean-Michel from the audience um, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Oysten from uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Oslo, Norway. Um, I would like to thank you for your presentation and also thank you for uh, lifting up the issue of Central African Republic. I think uh, MSF has done a very good job uh, regarding that, uh, which is of course very much necessary also. And MSF in Norway is also following up, putting pressure on the <laughs> ministry on that. So, so thank you for that. Um, I would like to say also that um, uh, regarding the issue of today that working on um, working in conflict settings is a kind of issue that we have been working on since I think since the establishment of the humanitarian affairs uh, 150 years ago. It was uh, the reason for establishing ICRC initially. So it's actually the, 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 the issue that we have been working on since the establishment of the humanitarian aid, in a way. Uh, and uh, as I see it, MSF is one of the organizations that are in the forefront of working in conflict settings, uh, together with ICRC and some others. So I was wondering, uh, looking at the issues that we see today, where humanitarian work in conflict settings is still the major challenge that we have. What kind of uh, learnings uh, do you have in MSF regarding how to operate in, in these uh, uh, hostile environments? Have you done some kind of, kind of um, assessment of, of lessons learned throughout your work uh, the, uh, the last years? Uh, and also wondering if you have some advice from your side regarding the system, systemic issues, how the system could improve with regard to working in uh, hostile environments and, and conflict settings. I think that it would be very much uh, interesting to hear your views on that. Okay. Thanks, and Jean-Michel here, and, then, and Enrique, and I'll come back to you. So please keep your questions brief so I can get a few more in, because we are already sleeping over time. Uh, good evening. I'm Jean-Michel from uh, Action Against Sangha. Just two questions shortly. You, you mentioned uh, the reason for MSF leaving Somalia as being based on uh, the casualties that you went through in, uh, and also the lack of access and you're facing in security. Now, is there any other areas where you have similar dilemma and is, is Syria not uh, a more or less a potential uh, similar situation? Mm -hmm. And my second question is, uh, is related as well is that France announced recently that they, are, they will try to keep the policy of not paying any ransom. And we have seen in, uh, not, I mean in the sale that uh, the price tag for expatriates has raised significantly from one to six, seven, five million, which start to be far beyond the capacity of an NGO, which obviously doesn't never pay any ransom, but in terms of risk management for an organization, do you think that it's not going to deter a lot of NGOs to go to risky area, and especially when there is some groups which are looking at uh, targeting humanitarian workers as a way to make business and to support their self-financing? Yeah. Thanks. 
Hi, Henrik Tom from ECHO in Brussels. Um, coming back briefly to CAR, um, first of all, I mean, as you know, we've been very, very interested in that and really tried to step up also advocacy inside the European Union on this in the last couple of months. And together with MSF, I think we have actually come a, cr a long way from what CAR used to be 12 months ago, even six months ago, where really nobody was paying attention to that. <coughs> Despite, as mentioned by Dennis, all the, the failures on the international political level, I think we're still have made some progress there, uh, just to give it a positive slant for once, but uh, it's true that this is by far not enough, and if this is supposed to be more than just after a peak of violence, a short, a short interest, and then it kind of goes back to what it was 20 years ago, uh, that indeed would be a major problem. So my question would be more how, to, especially as kind of the major health provider in that country, uh, because most people who live in Bangui, if they want to have some medical treatment, they go to see MSF for 600 kilometers east, uh, uh, how do you see a way of building up the the capacities in the country, especially in the health sector? We're trying also inside the Commission to bring in some development money for these things, but it's true that uh, if you've come to a place which is so run down, how do you ever get out of a humanitarian uh, response uh, in any kind of uh, uh, short-term perspective? Thank you. <laughs> That's an easy question. Okay, so we have uh, a few questions on the plate. Uh, first of all, I mean, the question, I think it was uh, one of the online questions about, uh, you know, the, the, the border crossing and how far the fragmentation of different actors will limit uh, the border crossing. Well, you know, I'm um, at this stage, uh, of course, like in any conflict, it, it's complex, but we, we are managing actually to, to negotiate our space. We are managing to, uh, to develop operations. The, the problem is that the border crossing should be facilitated and not an issue that should complicate the situation inside Syria. You know, it's not about, well, why do it if it's going to complicate? It's about why isn't it not done in order to make our life easier when we are in a very complicated setting. And so that's the issue. And we are today managing to carve operations. Uh, we have no restriction on nationalities. We have, uh, uh, from the, um, the, the different groups that we deal with, uh, we have actually had no incidents of um, um, patients being taken out of our structures. Of course, we can't for sure be uh, claim that there's not some form of triage in terms of accessing our, our, our structures, but we're not seeing any obvious total violation of our medical mi mission on, on the opposition side. Now, with, there are complications, and it is a very difficult place to work in, but what's not acceptable to us is the added complication of the non-facilitation, non-push to actually have a recognized and open border access to populations which are in extreme need. Um, now, the, the question about innovation is actually a good question because what we pr probably see as innovation is probably not so innovative in the end. You know, it's about working in a different way. Uh, as MSF, we, we're very much used and we want to work with our medical staff directly on the ground. And I think that that relates a bit potentially later also to the question on CAR to, to in, a, in a different way. Um, and so for us to work through medical networks to actually, you know, meet these people uh, uh, at the border areas to actually be able to try and negotiate how we're going to work and, and where they work, to use Skype, to use the different ways is actually quite innovative for us. It's a very indirect way. It's certainly not a way in which we choose, uh, uh, it's not a, a way of choice, let's say, but it's a compromise that we're doing that has actually so far uh, uh, paid off and enabled a, uh, uh, at least a form of delivery of some medical care in some of the areas. Now, learning from conflicts, and on the question uh, from, uh, from uh, MFA in Norway, uh, it is something we constantly try and do, but it's also uh, quite difficult. We are a frontline actor, um, and we have, uh, for instance, the book I mentioned at the beginning, Negotiation Revealed, is actually, uh, you know, it was, it was a difficult book to put together in MSF, because basically you open up to others some of the very difficult uh, compromises and choices and approaches that we're making. But the aim is very much to make sure that these experiences can be shared and taken on and learnt. Um, and it would be, I mean, in some ways, uh, this kind of book is, uh, is a step uh, of accountability in, in how we approach these kind of uh, very difficult settings. Now, obviously, internally, there's, uh, there's lots of lessons and exchanges that we can have and learn. We can always do a lot better. 
But um, you know, the case studies that I mentioned that are going online is also about learning how to position ourselves publicly, the consequences and how that happens. So we are not a research institute, but we do try and capitalize when it's important. We do try and assess when it's important. We have uh, the capacity to do so throughout the network that we have in MSF. And most of the work and the, uh, the most of the, the capitalization and research we do is very much on the ground and uh, based on, on the evidence of what our teams are doing and working on. Um, so that's now, the, the, there was a, a question a bit linked to this and how do we kind of challenge the aid system and how do we look at the aid system in a, more, in a broad manner and what can we do better? Well there, there will be a publication on uh, looking at that system, uh, whatever it means and whatever it is today, uh, but also challenging what, um, what is happening within the system. However, we want to be clear that as MSF we are not and we do not intend to become the ombudsman of humanitarian aid. That is not our role and that is not our aim. Uh, but we should be able to challenge uh, why certain things are not happening in certain environments, why we have to expand the kind of work we do because maybe we see less of an actor that used to be there and that is no longer there. Um, how can we work with some of the more local capacities that are being developed? in this kind of very new environment and what are these new actors which are not so new but suddenly people are looking at them that are coming on the scene uh, more newly prominently. Newly acknowledged was the term called. Newly acknowledged, yes. Acknowledged. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and had to work with them. So, so we are doing some work and we are trying to get this work across and uh, look, uh, watch this space in terms of uh, the beginning of next year, the publications that will be coming out. Um, but, um, uh, you know, the, the departure of Somalia is, uh, is, is an important question. And to be very clear, we did not leave Somalia because we had people killed <laughs> in the past. We did not leave Somalia because we had uh, no access to areas. We left Somalia because those that were guaranteeing our security, those that were actually the ones that we were negotiating with, that were actually uh, the leaderships, the authorities, no longer um, uh, saw the, the importance <coughs> of what we gave. They, there was no more uh, ability for them, you know, our resources outpaced what we gave, uh, what we brought as a medical organization. Uh, their interest was somewhere else than what we were providing. And when you get authorities that start becoming completely <coughs> complicit in terms of uh, extortion of uh, your resources uh, and have absolutely no um, uh, place no importance on what you deliver, of the medical care you provide, it's extremely difficult to negotiate. It's extremely difficult because what are we negotiating in these extremely hard environments? It's actually what we are providing. That's our strength, to be able to say, you will get a medical program in this extremely hard environment. But when the medical program is of no interest anymore, we have a problem. And it got to that level where we saw a lot of the problems we were having were actually linked and directly um, uh, the, there was direct complicity in terms of some of the top leadership in, uh, in, in Somalia and across Somalia. And this was not just a little isolated incident, it was across many of the different areas. So at some point you've got to ask yourself, uh, you know, we worked in much harder conditions in the past in Somalia, <coughs> and much harder peaks of violence, but we had a strong recognition by the leaders, by the authorities in terms of what we were providing. We had direct protection from them, even though we had to compromise with our guards and so on, but we knew that extortion was not something they would lightly stand by. But when they do start lightly standing by the extortion, the abuse of the medical mission, that was a, a one step too far for us, and this is what made us leave uh, Somalia. Now, this, this, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of um, insecurity, the issue of uh, high ransom payments, and uh, you know, it is a very worrying one. It's not just a worrying one in terms of international staff, it's actually something in time when everyone was stopped putting international staff because, uh, uh, because it's too dangerous, it's just going to have a repercussion on the national staff as well at some point. You know, it's just going to pass the buck along when they realize, well, you know, NGOs are going to be willing also due to their duty of care, due to their responsibility, to also take care of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, national or So it, it's, it's a very complex situation in terms of where things are going uh, um, on, on how to, uh, to protect the, the, the aid mission and so on. But, uh, you know, hopefully it will go through waves. And again, I think the responsibility here lies in authorities, and authorities actually ensuring and protecting and providing the, the uh, and pushing the message across to those that they, um, they represent of the importance of what we do. 
And when that's lost, this is when everything starts crumbling down behind in terms of the abuse. Did I miss some of them? Uh, had to build up CAR uh, and had to build up the medical capacity in CAR. Uh, again, we are not uh, a development organization and we also have to be very, diff uh, very careful in conflict settings not to be part of the state building apparatus because again, I think this is what lost a lot of people in Afghanistan where they, you know, uh, five, six years ago, Afghanistan was a good story in terms of where things were going. You know, it was part of the whole reconstruction, the national, uh, uh, the NSP strategic plan, which was under the government, under the coalition forces, a lot of NGOs falling under that plan and actually suddenly being completely locked out of half of uh, Afghanistan because, in fact, they were seen as part of the reconstruction of one side of the conflict. So again, we have to be very careful in these violent environments in terms of how far as humanitarians we don't mix our role with the reconstruction agenda that's required behind. Each of us have a clear role and there is a massive need for massive investment in a country like, uh, uh, like CAR, but we have to be very careful about who fulfills what role, not to confuse uh, the two. Um, I mean, to go to the parallel with Afghanistan, uh, what enabled us to, to relaunch operations in 2009 in Afghanistan and today have hospitals in Helmand, in Khost, uh, uh, Kunduz and, uh, and, and Kabul, which is far less difficult, but to negotiate in Khost with the Haqqani factions or in, uh, uh, in Helmand with, uh, with the Quetta Shura of the Taliban, it was about ensuring that we spoke to every one of the actors in conflicts in the same way. We spoke to the Americans, we spoke to the British, we spoke to the Taliban, in the same way as people that held the guns and held the power in terms of ensuring the full respect of the medical mission we were trying, we, what we intended to provide. And it was only through their full acceptance in terms of what our structures would be about and how we would run them that we then decided to launch the programs. And it takes time to actually negotiate this. The problem when you start getting involved in the reconstruction of a state is that then your relationship with the other belligerents becomes very difficult. But uh, maybe in terms of what we do, well, anyone working with MSF hopefully gain skills that they can bring to their ministries. And, uh, you know, I think for the moment we can see also that a lot of former staff of MSF are now in ministries in some of these very hard conflicts that have dragged on for a long time, be it Sudan, be it Afghanistan, and so on. Sharam, thank you so much. I have to close it here. I know there are other people that want to uh, ask questions, but we've gone about 40, uh, 50 minutes over time. Um, and actually, we have finished with the advisory group. We're going on to another engagement with uh, some of our colleagues here tonight. Um, but you know, you'll probably be around still for another 10 minutes if people want to um, chat a bit further with you. But I really want to thank you for you know the honesty and the frankness once again with which you have addressed the topic, but also replied to the questions. And I know it's not easy, you know, sort of uh, laying bare your organisation and the dilemmas that you go through um, with such you know with the with the public out there because it's being live streamed. You've left us with some you know very sombre reflections, but critically important for you know the state of humanitarian action today. So we we'll carry on discussing about this tomorrow for you know those of us who are coming back for the advisory group meeting. But thank you, a lot of food for thought. Thank you well, very thank much. Thank you very much. Sarah.